answer any questions you might have about particular movies and so on, um, except for ones that I don't know the answer to, then I hope you will um, ask them, and I hope you've enjoyed this, and I really appreciate you coming to see me today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if any of you have any questions that you'd like to ask, go ahead and raise your hand. I will bring the mic to you. We are only operating with one instead of the normal two, so if you just be patient, I'll bring it to you and uh, speak very clearly and slowly into the mic. Thank you. Hi. I was wondering about Band of Brothers. Yes. How accurate were the planes in that and how you felt about that as far as the, uh, the aircraft? Are you talking about the D-Day takeoff sequences? Um, sure, or they had, you know, the, the C-47 drops, all of the, the parachutes. Well, <laughs> I have to hand it to HBO. They did a very good job. They had technical advisors like Ed Pepping, who was really there and really done that. They, um, they didn't cut any corners. They used a bunch of real C-47s and C-53s for the, um, the dawn takeoff sequences for the, for the, um, for the aircraft. It, it, Beautifully filmed. It's really well done. The only um, thing that I've caught, and it, this was sim simply out of necessity, is that when you see the uh, the paratroopers inside the C-47, um, you only see 12 of them inside the aircraft. There was usually 24 to 28, and the only reason I can see that they would have kept it down to 12 is that it would have crowded the shot too much. They needed to have room to move around to make it a little more interesting. The, um, the sequences when they were flying over Carantan after midnight, yeah, Ed Pepping, who was in the, um, the, the actual Band of Brothers, Easy Company of the 506, he said that's what it was like. You couldn't hear the explosion, but you could feel them, you could see them. It was, it was like a fireworks show. It, it, it brought back some very strong memories when he saw that sequence. He said, that's what it was like. It was terrifying, and you just couldn't believe um, what it was like. The movie captures it really well. He said, I weighed 175 pounds, but I, when I was loaded up with all my equipment, I weighed 305 pounds. They had four guys to help him into the plane. And when, at the end, when they bailed out, all I had to do was let gravity take over. Thank you. Next question. Here's another one coming. To my knowledge, there isn't had never been a movie about uh, Howard Hughes Spruce Goose. In and its by itself, you mean? Yeah. Well, or part of a movie. Yeah. Well, The Aviator probably would fulfill that somewhat. And the uh, Aviator does a pretty good job of telling the Spruce Goose story. It's obvious that, that no, there's never been a film that just tells the the development, the reason that Hughes and uh, and Henry Kaiser decided to build the the, uh, the HK-1, but the the movie Aviator does a pretty good job of it. Um, those are the the Spruce Goose you see in the movie is a radio control model with I think a 16 foot wingspan, weighs 350 pounds, and it's radio controlled. And they filmed it in Long Beach at the spot where the real Spruce Goose actually flew, using low camera angles with um, 1940s era um, landing craft and, and other ships and, and vessels in the background. It's, it's really very well done. It's hard to tell that it's, that it's a miniature. So for that reason, it's, it's um, probably the best you're going to see on film. Thank you. Uh, did they use any other real planes in the Indiana Jones films? Any real planes? Yeah, yeah, they did. Well, as I mentioned, the Waco UBF-2 that you see at the beginning, the short stolen. The, um, the flying wing, the German wing, is not real. Although the German, the, the Horton brother did design some flying wings for the, for the Luftwaffe. The one you see in the movie is completely fictional. Originally, it was supposed to be a four engine, but budget constraints cut it down to two. And it was built at Vickers in England, and I, I still wonder about these men who worked at Vickers, one of the oldest and most respected British aeronautical firm, building a plane with swastikas on it. 
Um, the, uh, the Ford Tri-Motor you see in uh, Temple of Doom is a real aircraft, and they use models for the crash sequences in which they crash into the Himalayas. And the, um, the plane in uh, Temple of Doom, um, the one that are, the one he detaches from the, uh, the German airship is uh, a stamp. It's a, a, well actually, it's, it's, it's a simple little German um, uh, biplane with a ring mount on it. And you, somehow he manages to climb down into it, no problem. You notice that the wind does not ruffle his hat at all, even though they're flying at 80 miles an hour. <laughs> and he and his father are back there, and they're flying this thing, and they manage to crash land it. Uh, that's a real aircraft, but <laughs> Spielberg doesn't worry too much about believability. And the German fighters that come after them are called Pilatus, and they were owned by the Spanish Air Force. And they had um, propane machine guns on them for the, for the shooting up sequences. Again, Spielberg never worried about whether something was believable as long as it was exciting, partly when, it, when the plane crashes into, the, into the, uh, the tunnel and the pilot is skidding alongside Andy and his father and he looks down like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't bother getting any real ammo, enemy 109 for that sequence. Yeah, but most of the planes are real. They're just out of place. I have a question about the B-25s and Catch-22. Yes. The mass uh, takeoff scene, was that uh, authentic or was that a little bit exaggerated? <laughs> no, that's real. Uh, I'm glad you asked me about that because Jonah Appleby's husband, Jim, was one of the pilots for uh, the Catch-22. Um, Catch-22 is unique in that it's, it's a, a very black comedy. Um, really, really kind of hard to watch. But it, they filmed the aviation sequences in Mexico for six months for 12 minutes of footage in the movie. The rest of it um, isn't having anything to do with the planes at all. But they collected 17 B-25s for the film down in Mexico. Um, and the, um, that one long sequence of takeoff, when every, that was one long shot. And Zona said that it scared the heck out of her husband because you literally had to get into the air and peel away because 15 seconds behind you was another plane. And if you didn't have the takeoff power and he smacked into you, you were going into the bay. He said it was one of the toughest sequences he ever did. He is also the pilot of that plane when you, when you hear, when um, uh, Martin Baltham is talking to Minderbinder and they're just standing by the runway and they're not paying any attention. And you see that one plane come in and skid and then it goes out of a shot and you hear it skidding and then it crashes. And they're, they're not paying any attention to it. That's Jim Appleby flying that plane. Okay. Uh, in your book, do you cover Thunderbolt, the other William Wilder movie um, that was made about the, uh, the P-47, or do you have any uh, notes or comments about that particular, oh. more of a documentary movie? Actually, <laughs> I was going to have a chapter about documentary, but my editor was saying, you've got to finish this book sometime. Um, so it's probably going to go into the next book, but yeah, Thunderbolt was one of one of the ones I had planned it, uh, had planned on including, as well as winning your wings and victory through air power and Memphis Belle, the story of a flying, flying fortress. So I'm afraid you're going to have to wait for the next book on that one. Um, what initially started you into creating the book? Like you talked about how you had a passion for the airplanes and the movies and such, but. Did anyone push you into making the book, or did you just kind of stumble upon it yourself? <laughs> um, encouragement. It depends on whether you talk to my friends or my wife. <laughs> um, this was just something that, actually, I'll show you right here. Um, the man who's in the center, lower center, John Finn. Um, he was the oldest living Medal of Honor recipient. In the, in the country. He died at age 100 in 2010. And he was the last surviving Medal of Honor recipient from Pearl Harbor. He was a neighbor of mine. And I got to know him for many years. And sometimes we would just sit and talk. And I once asked him 
what did you think of Torah, Torah, Torah? And he said, well, you know, and he loved to dr drink sarsaparilla. So he would just sit there and take a swig and, well, they did a pretty good job of that movie. They did, the, 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 kid, the kid playing me was in the right spot, and they, they did a great job with it. I was really impressed. Well, then I pushed my luck, and I said, what did you think of, of Pearl Harbor? <laughs> Took a long swig, and he said, well, less said about that movie, the better. But that was actually the genesis of this book. Because I started thinking, maybe, you know, it would be nice to have these, these guys tell us what they think of these movies. Um, the, the idea, I have a great passion for history, aviation history. Um, I wanted the real people to have a chance to say what they thought. Not just the technical. If you want technical issues on these movies, Bruce Orris is when Hollywood ruled the sky, one of the best. The Motion Picture Hollywood, uh, Motion Picture Stunt Pilots by uh, Hugh Wynn, uh, Celluloid Wing by Jim Farmer. Those are all great reference books. This is the kind of book you'd like to have when you, you want to enjoy a movie and you want a little bit of a trivia and some of the things about the production, some of the, the quotes, some of the things that happen behind the scenes, uh, interesting facts about the airplane. So I did it not only um, out of a passion for it, but because it seemed like a fun project. It took me four years to do it. And I'm glad I did it, but boy, am I glad I'm finished, too. I have a question. In the movie Pearl Harbor, how many of the planes were actually real? Oh, I can't give you an exact accurate. I think they had two P-40s, four B-25s, uh, there were still quite a few Tora 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 cast off around at the time. And then, of course, there's a fair amount of miniature and CGI work. Um, Steve Hinton from Planes of Fame flew some of the B-25, one of the B-25. They actually did that, the, the do little launch sequences. They did that at um, Corpus Christi on board the, um, the Lexington. The, the Lexington was just sitting there in on you know at a dock in Corpus Christi, and they actually managed to take it take off a B-25 from her deck. So they really did that. Um, the P-40 dogfight sequences, in which um, Rafe and Danny managed to wipe out the entire Japanese for, uh, Air Force while wearing Hawaiian shirts. Don't take that too seriously. Um, it's spectacular, but I I think with CGI they started doing things with planes that a pilot could never survive. The ME-109 and one of the Spitfires in the movie is also from Plane to Fame. They are real real aircraft. Of course, they're the, the Spanish ME-109 with a, with a Merlin engine. There are quite a few original real planes in it. But um, my big beef with that film is the plot. You know, let's not, not worry about history, you know, but, but that's okay. It's still exciting and um, I've talked to a lot of Pearl Harbor veterans, and their, their reactions are mixed. It's that it's exciting, but that's where they leave it. Uh, I've written one book, and I'm uh, working on another. I've published one book. I'm working on another about World War II aviation mm -hmm. crashes in the United States. And in, in my research, what really struck me was how a lot of these boys had never even driven a car, much less been in an airplane. And I was I, wondering if you could talk a little bit about the impact some of these movies like Dive Bomber and Wings from the okay. 1930s had on these guys who later on became pilots during the Second World War. The movies, uh, if you look at what Warner Brothers did during the war, I mean, Warner Brothers had to be one of the most successful recruiters for military personnel during the war. Warner went to war in, in every way, and they produced so many films about the ground war and the, the, the naval war and the air war. Um, in many cases, if, if, if you talk to a lot of the pilots, like Steve Pisano, who's in this uh, lower right, he was inspired to join the Air Force uh, to become a pilot because of um, Dawn Patrol, the original Dawn Patrol with... Um, Richard Barthelmus. Um, he was 
he was not alone. There were a lot of pilots who, saw, who got their first inkling that they wanted to get into um, the military because of what they saw on film. Um, Dive Bomber with Fred McMurray and uh, Errol Flynn, 1941, um, filmed at North Island in San Diego, was a very powerful recruiting film. And it came out just before the war started. Matter of fact, when you watch Don Patrol, uh, uh, Dive Bomber, um, you see North Island, you'll see a lot of planes that are still in pre-war uh, gray and gold and some that are in blue, that's because they were taking each squadron off the line and painting them blue because they knew at some point they were going to get into the fight. One of the squadrons you see there is a squadron of um, Douglas Devastators that, that is uh, Torpedo 3, which um, was a part of the Battle of Midway by flying off the USS Yorktown during the Battle of Midway. And most of the planes you see in that sequ in, uh, of the Devastators were shot down during the Battle of Midway. To get back to your question, I would have to say that the impact of, of um, Hollywood and the air war, air war movies and aviation movies had a very significant effect on recruiting and patriotism. Movies like Aerial Gunner and Bombardier, uh, Captains of a the Cloud, they were all highly successful in increasing recruitment. If you think that's a dead phenomenon, look at what Top Gun did to Naval Aviator uh, um, applications. After Top Gun came out, um, this man right here on the top center, um, Captain Rick Ludwig, he, um, he commanded Top Gun right after the movie came out and he could not believe how much his job changed because of the application for naval pilot training right after Top Gun. So po Hollywood is a very powerful tool for uh, social and uh, social change and military change. You can, you can, it, it, I talk about it quite a bit in the book and how the social attitudes of the time were either affected by or had an effect on how Hollywood filmed things. You know that there weren't a lot of movies about, that were pro-military during the Vietnam War. If you wanted to sell a movie, you had to be making fun of the military. And that didn't change until about 1978, 1979, when some fairly pro-military movies came out, and they, we started changing our attitude towards you know, uh, the, the armed forces. So Hollywood was, it is an extremely powerful recruiting film, recruiting tool, and I, I, it's, it's worth really paying attention to how it uh, made a difference during the war. I don't think we would have had as good or as successful a time of it if it wasn't for uh, the motion pictures being on our side. Okay, Mark, we got one more question and you got two minutes to answer it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is a question about a plane that we have here at the museum that we're very fond of, the Fairchild 24, the beautiful red shiny plane that was once owned for a short time by Edgar Bergen. We tell many jokes about that plane as far as Charlie McCarthy actually piloting it. <laughs> I, un <laughs> I understand there is a movie called Look Who's Laughing in which they actually had Edgar Bergen piloting the plane over Fibber McGee's wistful vista. And, wis and <laughs> Fibber McGee was supposedly somehow getting into that plane and without any knowledge of piloting, flying it. Have you ever heard of the movie Look Who's Laughing? And yeah, I have heard of it, and unfortunately, I did not include it. <laughs> I knew this was coming. <laughs> I, 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 there were I had an almost 95 comedy films to pick from, and I had to pick it, cut it down. So I know which one you're talking about. And yes, and I understand it. That's exactly what happened. They did have Charlie McCarthy flying, flying the Fairchild. Um, I can't recall um, Faber McGee's role in it, though. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those silly back in the 30s, they, they pretty much could get away with anything in, um, you know, taking some poor schmuck and putting him up on a plane and then having him create complete havoc. And that was, that was done ad nauseum from flying deuces on all the way through to Bowery Boys and Abbott and Costello. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I do know what you're talking about, but unfortunately I did not include it. 
I apologize for that. Does our plane have any role in the movie history then? That's Was it actually used in the creation of the movie? Was our plane used? I still didn't catch. Was was the plane, the Fairchild 24, that's in our collection, mm -hmm. actually a prop used in the movie? That is something you'd have to ask the museum archivist or the curator. I really couldn't tell you. Um, it's the right type, but that that's as far as whether or not it's the actual serial number. I don't know. You know, they, Hollywood just grab. It's an airplane. It's got wings. It's got a propeller. Use it. And in many cases, they didn't, it, that, that's why it's really tough to, to track down certain planes, because they kept no record on who owned the plane or what, whatever. The pilot would have kept records of it and, and the owner, but that's about as far as it went. Hollywood didn't care. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. All Thank right, you folks. all very, very much for coming. Thanks very much, folks. Thanks, Mark.